Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjection, the last arguments to which kings resort. I ask the gentleman, sir, what means this martial array if its purpose be not to force us into subjection? Can gentlemen assign any other possible motive for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir, she has none. They are meant for us, and they can be meant for no other. They were sent over to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the British ministry have been so long forging. And what have we to oppose them? Shall we try argument? Sir, we have been trying that for the last 10 years. Have we anything new to offer upon the subject? Nothing. We have held the subject up to every light of which it is capable, but it has been all in vain. Shall we resort to entreaty and humble supplication? And what terms shall we find which have not already been exhausted? Let us not, I beseech you, sir, deceive ourselves longer. We have done everything that could be done to avert the storm that is now coming on. We have petitioned, we have remonstrated, we have supplicated, and we have prostrated ourselves before the throne and implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and parliament. Our petitions have been slighted. Our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult. Our supplications have been disregarded, and we have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the court. In vain after these things may we indulge the vain hope of peace and reconciliation. There is no longer any room for hope. If we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve inviolate those inestimable privileges for which we have so long been contending, if we mean not to basely abandon that noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged and which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest has been obtained, we must fight. I repeat it, sir. We must fight. An appeal to arms and the God of hosts is all that is left to us. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when will we be stronger? Will it be the next week or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard is stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we learn the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope? Sir, we are not weak if we make use of those means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. Three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess is invincible to any force our army can send against us. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations who will raise up our friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the brave alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable, and let it come. I repeat, sir, let it come. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the crash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God! I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death!